the vote on the amendment 0098-2020, that's on medical devices. Amendment 1, adopted. Amendment 2, adopted. Amendment 3, adopted. Amendment 4, D, adopted. So those were the results. So we now come to the second voting session with the final vote. Final on vote on medical devices. Number of members voting, 696, 693 in favour, one against and two abstentions. So that is carried. Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today, uh, let's say we have some big news or great news. Uh, maybe it's history, so let's, uh, let's make it like it's history today. Uh, so we had uh, the vote from the EU Parliament. Uh, there is still some steps, and we'll talk about that, uh, regarding the extension of the EU MDR until next year, so 26th of May 2021. And I have with me Eric Volbrecht, who is helping us to make the interpretation of all this, because I think there is a lot to say about that. Uh, but uh, Eric, first, uh, you remember we had um, this, um, this episode uh, about coronavirus with, uh, with uh, Basil Acra, yourself, and Gerd Boss, and we talked about that. We talked about the extension of the EU MDR, and we said mainly it's, it's not possible due to the fact that it takes mainly six months for the parliaments to um, look at that, vote on this and that. Now, apparently, the rule is not really applicable. So can we go to the context of all this? What, what happened since the last two, three weeks or four weeks? What, what happened exactly? Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, because, of course, there, since, since I've been one of the people that has been saying, like, don't count all the date of application being moved. And now the date of application is being moved. So, of course, I'm getting a lot of critical remarks uh, from uh, here and there. Um, yeah, I mean, um, as my grandmother would always used to say, under pressure, everything becomes fluid. Uh, right. And that's also uh, what happened here. Um, because under, under normal circumstances, it is impossible to, uh, to, to move the date uh, or to make a proposal to a regulation as quickly as happened. Because if you look at it legally, uh, then um, they followed the ordinary legislative procedure, which is the old co-decision procedure, and that's a procedure that normally can take quite a long time except if there is an extreme, uh, let's say, political will for everybody to not be in anyone's way and to make it as easy as possible for a proposal to sail through. And parties also have to be willing to cut quite a lot of procedural corners, which all of which happened in this case. So uh, this is actually, it's, it's quite an exceptional situation. And as you will remember with this whole MDR, we've only had exceptional situations so yeah. far. Because first we had, we, basically we already had two amendments to the MDR that they called corrigenda, but in my legal opinion were totally not corrigenda uh, because they were not just moving uh, misspellings around or stuff like that. Now they were really amendments. Now we have our first real formal uh, amendment to the uh, to the MDR. And yeah, I mean, what what you see is that suddenly in the beginning of April things started to move like crazy. Will the Commission propose a delay to the medical device regulation deadline this week? Well, Lily, the Commission is working on a proposal to postpone the entry into force of the new medical devices regulation for one year. We're working hard to submit this proposal early April, and we call on Parliament and on Council to adopt it quickly, as the deadline for entry into force is at the end of May. This will relieve pressure from national authorities and industry, and it will allow them to focus fully on urgent priorities related to the coronavirus crisis. And uh, there was this commission proposal. Suddenly, uh, the commission proposal uh, went to the, to the parliament quite quickly. The council, in the meantime, also corrected some uh, oversight in the uh, commission's proposal 
and uh, before you knew it, uh, last uh, well, yesterday actually, it's it's Saturday now, Friday the seventeenth. We had the, uh, the the Parliament plenary vote on this proposal to amend the NDR, and you can say that is actually quite exceptional because it all went very, very, very extremely quickly because they set it up in a way that they could compress many timelines and also they, they actually um, have also foregone some of the other things that are supposed to happen normally, like for example, uh, the, the 20 days between publication in the official journal and the entry into force, they just threw that out the window. The normal eight weeks consultation period for national parliaments at the end of the legislative procedure, they also said, well, we have no time for that. And also, they did a very nice, I think, procedural trick where, uh, because this is a co-decision procedure, everybody needs to agree for the, uh, so the parliament and the council for the amendment uh, to be adopted. So what you don't want is anything unexpected happening in the procedure. And for that reason, the council, they had, an, uh, they had a, a meeting in the presidency uh, before uh, the uh, before the proposal went to the parliament, council said, "Okay, this is we are giving a mandate of what we consider an acceptable um, an acceptable uh, first reading, which was basically a copy of the commission proposal with the uh, oversight uh, that maybe we can also talk about later. Uh, I've I've blogged about it as well. Corrected." Then the European Parliament said, oh, this is an excellent idea. We will vote this in with a huge uh, amount of votes uh, pro. I think there was only one vote against. Yeah, we, we are all asking ourselves if, if this the one who votes against just missed the button or <laughs> didn't choose the right thing, but yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, and then of course, yeah, so that this, then, then the Parliament, uh, they adopted their first reading. That's what happened yesterday. So a lot of people immediately uh, threw their heads in the air and said, this is adopted. No, it's not completely true because now the council also has to adopt its first position, uh, uh, first reading. And I expect them to do that in the course of the coming week. So Wednesday, Thursday, something like that. And then we will have basically uh, everything will be, uh, well, formally almost done. And the council has already said this was uh, this is a document that appeared in uh, Erlex this morning, in which the uh, council secretariat says uh, um, the the parliament's uh, first reading corresponds to uh, to what the council wants. So we uh, uh, we uh, uh, yeah it says the parliament's position reflects what had been previously agreed between the institutions so that shows that they've been really back channeling a lot and the council should therefore be in a position to approve the parliament's position bringing to a close the first reading for both institutions so that's go that's what's going to happen uh, coming week i'll make sure that you have the link to this document in the show yeah. notes because then people can also see the, uh, the, the uh, yeah, basically the amendment as it's going to take place, because actually the one little thingy happened compared to the commission proposal, or you could say two things. So first they corrected the, uh, the commission's uh, oversight of moving the dates in Article 123. Yeah, there was a mistake. I think you, you mentioned that there was something forgotten because they made a copy paste from, uh, from, the, from, the, from the MDR without the corrigendum. So then okay. they missed this point. Yeah. Old version, yeah. They looked up the, uh, the initial version uh, and not the uh, corrected. That's what you get if you do corrigenda without a formal procedure. Yeah, and <laughs> mistakes get made. But anyway, so that, that was corrected and they did one other thing because um, uh, they, uh, they moved all the dates in the, uh, all the dates of 26 May 2020 to 26 May 2021, which uh, only in the case of article, yeah, there was one date with regard to UDA, UDI carrier marking, 
where they would basically where you already had a date of 26 May 2021 yeah. in the regulation for UDI for carriers three for class three. Yeah. Right. And since that basically had a net effect of zero, <laughs> they took it out. So these these are these are the two proposals, uh, or sorry, the two uh, the two changes that they were made uh, that made were made compared to the commission original proposal, and that's that's how this is going to uh, uh, enter into force. Because politically, it's a done deal now. The, the the council has said we agree with this. The parliament has put its position in there. They only need to consult the ECOSOC and the committee of the regions and. I already saw that the committee or that the EcoSoc committee already had its position paper ready yesterday. So yeah. these people had also been in the loop uh, of the whole deck channel situation. So everybody is in complete uh, go forward mode. And yeah, I think it'll be. Uh, I, I think we can expect publication uh, early May. Yeah, or maybe I think. Even before. I I think I think it's uh, it's uh, as you've said it's really exceptional. Um, just to remind them, maybe for people that will watch that really later, uh, we are in a period where we have this coronavirus, so we have uh, a big situation here for uh, medical device supplies. Uh, we notified bodies that have to review maybe some material with a, a lot of situation that is happening, and I think there is a lot of pressure on all the member states now related to uh, the spreading of this virus. And um, this is one of the reasons that they said it's better to push that one year because it will relieve some pressure on manufacturers, on notified bodies, on governments, etc. for for that. Um, so um, can we say this is a good idea or anyway, it was kind of, it's, it was really necessary to do that even without coronavirus? Well, if you ask me, <laughs> uh, I've, I've been of the school of thought that had defended that if we would not have had the coronavirus uh, uh, epidemic, uh, the date of application would not have been moved. Okay. Of course, that's, we, we will never know, but that's, uh, that's still what I think. Um, so now uh, what we have is an additional year in which the, uh, the directives will be applicable. And an, an, an additional year in which the MDR is not applicable yet. So what is what is that going to mean for um, uh, for the market? Oh yeah, and also there's there's also one additional thing that we should also discuss because what everybody's always focusing on on the move of the date of application in the proposal, which is which is nice. But they also did one, I think, other really interesting thing is that they made it possible for the Article 59 procedure, yeah. so the procedure under which, and that's actually for Corona, that is really uh, important. They made it possible for, uh, the, uh, for the Commission to issue implementing acts that extend emergency measures for particular devices or groups of devices to the whole EU. So it's, it's member states that have the rights now to say this device can go to my market without going through all the process uh, of exactly. um, MDD or yeah, MDR. Basically, basically what they did was they created an emergency, uh, an additional emergency market access mechanism under the directives, which I think is quite exceptional because it's, it's quite a big handover of... Uh, of uh, jurisdiction of the member states to the uh, commission. So in the next year, what we are going to see, I think is, uh, we are going to see that uh, it will need to become clear what the commission can do uh, and also whether the member states are willing to allow the commission to work with this procedure. Because for this procedure, you always need one, at least one national emergency measure of a member state that is going to be escalated to the commission and then the commission says, okay, let's roll this out for the rest of Europe. So we'll need to see how this is going to work. If people that are interested in that MedTech Europe wrote a position paper in December last year, in which they said, well, we can also work with the Article 59 procedure as a last resort. Um, and in which they explain how that would work, but also express some reservations because the Article 59 procedure is not really, let's say, a high throughput procedure. So you cannot uh, do it 
because since it requires an implementing act, it's not a very fast mechanism. So we'll need to see how the Commission is going to work with that, uh, how much it's actually going to benefit us. And then, in the next year, since the, the uh, directives are still applicable for uh, another year, we will need to see what the notified bodies can still do in terms of uh, the bottleneck. Right, because we have this bottleneck with uh, companies that need to move their products to the MDR. They can do that in two ways. Either extend their uh, existing uh, MDD or AI MDD certificates into the uh, now 2021-2024 period, or they can go for an MDR uh, certificate. So there is uh, the no. notified bodies actually, um, so they were really in the mixed situation where they had really to um, to um, uh, to do to work on the MDD to make the extension of the MDD uh, work. So I think they were really focused on that, not really on the MDR because we didn't have a lot of companies that were MDR certified. Um, now they have one year more to do that. Um, they have one year more to extend again those certificates, but those certificates are, uh, the NDD certificates will still be valid until 2024. It's not like they will be one year more valid. Um, no, 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 definitely not. Now the end date is still uh, 2024. So basically what we are seeing uh, is, and that's, that's how I'm currently thinking about it, it's a bit like a waterbed effect, you could say almost, or communicating vessels. So you give the system a bit more room on one end, but that means you're going to put more pressure on the other end. Okay. And what we, what we see with the, uh, what we see now at the, um, with this additional year coming, uh, you get other weird capacity problems. For example, there are now manufacturers that are uh, contacting their notified bodies. Can we still start up another conformity assessment procedure under the MDD or the AI MDD, so we can get a certificate during this extra year. Because for, for example, products of which they thought, okay, then we are not going to place them on the market for, uh, for some time, but now they see additional possibilities, so they'll try it anyway. But now what we are seeing is that notified bodies are saying, uh, well, that's a nice idea, but we don't have capacity for that because we are completely full already. And I think what is also uh, notified bodies were also taken by surprise by this measure because notified bodies uh, had also set up their own internal resources planning with the date of application of 26 May 2020 in mind. So they have, uh, what they've done is they've, they've uh, prepared for people doing uh, work on, uh, on the, the old directives until that time, and by then they would switch all capacity to MDR. And now there's another year. So you see that notified bodies have problems switching their capacity around. Especially, for example, with the notified bodies that did not even put in an application for the MDR. Yeah, so because they, to ask they, you. <laughs> they are suddenly in business for an additional year. And if you were planning to wind down your whole business to only surveillance of existing certificates and suddenly you have another year, what are you going to do? I mean, uh, also in the case, maybe those notified bodies, as they plan to close, if I can say, uh, there are people that, or auditors that maybe move to other notified bodies that are MDR uh, accredited or something like that, and now they have no more capacity, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Or there are people ran away because uh, that's, yeah. that's also possible. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a crazy situation, and we'll need to see how this is going to be, uh, going to be handled. And also, there's, there's the interesting, uh, recently, the, uh, the, the MDCG guidance ah, yeah. for remote audits came out oh, yeah. Yeah, during Corona time. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of difference that is going to make. Because uh, you could, for example, 
conceive that they uh, they get a lot of good experience with that uh, and then say well we might extend it to make sure that we do not get into a big uh, mess with the last MDD and AI MDD uh, conformity assessments running yeah so I think there can be a lot of uh, a lot of things that can happen after that so uh, yeah we have really to to identify that and see uh, if this is good or bad for them maybe or or, or not um, in terms of the consequences now to this um, this proposal just a reminder this is just for MDR so IVDR is really out of scope for that so IVDR is still planned date of application uh, May 26 2022 is it correct? That's correct. Yeah, nothing changes with regards to the uh, IVDR, which I think is actually uh, quite a missed opportunity. Okay. Because if, 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 if you look at the justification of this proposal and also the justification to make these Article 59 measures possible ahead of the date of application of yep. the MDR, I mean, there's also an enormous lack of uh, COVID-19 Test. Test. Yeah. Why on earth? I mean, uh, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's. I just can't, can't, can't figure it out. Why didn't they also include this for the IVDR? Because the IVDR has a similar mechanism in Article Fifty Four. It would have been so easy, I would say, to say, okay, well, we can also do Article uh, Fifty Four for the IVDR ahead of the date of application. Because uh, because that will also allow us to roll out uh, uh, IVDR approved uh, or, or uh, pan European approved um, COVID nineteen tests earlier. So and I they hope, didn't. I hope, I think it, I hope. it's really a big missed opportunity. I hope they will listen to this episode <laughs> and hear about the ID and maybe then take that into account for the next vote of the parliament or next proposal that they will do. Because, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, there is also this impact about IVD D, uh, for the coronavirus, all the tests that are asked uh, to be provided. And they will be needed also afterwards. But uh, it would be really a great idea maybe to have also this Article 54 uh, approved or um, in, in scope, if I can say, of this, um, of this change. Um, in terms of uh, the consequences of the UMDR, um, so delay, if I can say. Um, what about UDAMED? UDAMED is still planned 2022, or we maybe have an opportunity to have it in 2021 with that, or what, what do you see about this? Well, it depends on, uh, depends on who you ask uh, at the moment, because uh, indeed, they also moved the dates for UDAMED. Uh, to 2021, which means that formally it's possible again to do a UDAMED is ready notice before 25 March 2021 and then go for a UDAMED live on, tw on uh, 26 May 2021, the, the new date of application. That is legally possible. Okay, so it's really, it's something that is actually, they said 2022, but with this proposal now, it's, it's they have still a new chance to, to place it next year. Yeah, but the question is, are they going to do it? Because uh, the commission also did not uh, change the, uh, the date on their website uh, yet. And I've heard some rumors of, uh, from, uh, from, uh, uh, that the commission is actually uh, saying, no, we are not changing this at all because uh, we have the... Um, we have a, uh, as, as, as Commissioner uh, Kariakides was saying in the uh, December 2019 EBSCO uh, meeting, yeah, but uh, the MDR is completely prepared for the situation that UDAMED is not ready in time. And that's why, uh, well, if it's not ready in time, then we are just going to do what we are going to do. And then you need to apply Article 123. So it's also possible that the commission is still in that scenario and says uh, Unimet is going to be ready when it's ready. And in the meantime, you can just uh, see how you uh, apply Article 123. And that seems to be the position that the commission is currently going to take, but they haven't yeah, publicly confirmed that. Okay. So we have now the date of application that moved to 26th of May 2021. Uh, is there any exception for any products, any class or anything that 
this is not applicable or every product has now to consider this date for their production. Yeah, that's that's exactly what's happening. They, they just move the date everywhere. So uh, there is no exception to anybody except from what was in the MDR already. Okay. And uh, in terms of Brexit, Swixit, Chugzit, is there any change now? Well, <clears throat> um, there isn't. Well, there there is a change in the sense that um, I would say for uh, Swixit and Turksit, there is another year okay. to uh, to sort out the political uh, difficulties with um, adopting the MDR for uh, the, the for Switzerland and Turkey. And with the UK uh, for the Brexit, it's different because for Brexit we have a, a fixed date. Uh, 31 December uh, 2020, on which the uh, on which the application of European law in the UK ends, unless the UK and the EU agree before 1 July this year okay. that they are going to extend this transitional period with one or two years. And uh, the UK has already said about this transitional period, uh, forget it, we're not doing that. We are going to uh, exit by the end of 2020, hard Brexit or not. So it means actually that the UK will be in the weird situation that uh, as, far as, they, uh, as far as I know, they have calculated that the MDR would already apply when there is Brexit. So for that reason, they have uh, adopted their own legislation that basically copies the MDR. Okay. And they expect it to have a sort of level playing field uh, this way. But now we, get, we, we are going to the, say, to the weird situation that as a result of this move of a year, there will be uh, a period uh, between uh, uh, 1 January uh, 2021 and end of May 2021, in which the EU will have different legislation than the, the UK expected them to have with a different level playing field. So the UK will have a, a more strict legislation than the EU, is it correct? Yeah, which is completely, of course, not what they intended with the whole Brexit, because they were, uh, they were intending to be more lenient than the EU, because that was going to be their big competitive advantage. So I think the, uh, I mean, for the UK, combining, from a medical devices perspective, combining uh, Brexit with uh, Corona uh, and the way the MDR works, that, that is like a perfect storm for them. So the only thing basically the UK can do is also move the application of their law for another year as well if they want to remain at a diff at, at level playing field. Okay. So yeah, I think uh, I think the, the, there is we have one consequence of the move to the uh, to the the date of application that people really enjoy because they have one year more to do that. But uh, we see now there is really some small consequences that uh, have also to be managed, and uh, this is really important for for different states. Um, what about economic operators? So um, they will also have to be economic operators by the twenty sixth of May, twenty twenty one. But um, they, they will have less time for the products that they, they will have on their store, on their, on their uh, warehouse, to be delivered to their customer. Before it was four years, now it is three years. Yeah, basically, uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, uh, depending on how you look at it, because, uh, because, the, the, because Article 120 four or five says that, uh, uh, first of all, devices that were placed on the market prior to the date of application, they can be sold until uh, uh, end of May 2025. Yeah. Uh, so you have five years to, uh, uh, to, uh, to sell off uh, old products. And then uh, for the uh, and then there's this and then there's also the, the sell-off period for products that were placed on the market under a certificate or a declaration of conformity that was valid under Article 123. You can also sell them in the supply chain until uh, 2025. Yeah. So basically, that period 
uh, was shortened by a year. That's correct. So then it means that, yeah, they, this is mainly the issue that they will have is uh, to really manage their stock. Um, last point maybe that I have is about Annex 16. So um, we have non-medical products uh, that also need to be placed on the market, or if I can say with the UMDR, uh, if there is a common specification available. Uh, so if the common specification are published before the, before the date of application next year, uh, what is happening to them then? Uh, well, uh, basically, the, the system for Annex 16 products remains the same. So there is a date of application. Common specifications are published either before the date of application, in which case they apply as from the date of application. And if they are not published by the uh, date of application, then they apply from six months after publication. So basically, the Commission now has another year to adopt these common specifications if they want them to uh, enter into force by the date of application. And otherwise, then if they don't get them published in the coming year, then they will apply six months after. Uh, so then they will apply at the earliest the end of November 2021. Okay. If they don't manage to publish them before uh, the date of application. So I think, uh, yeah, this is, um, as I said, for some industry, there is a lot of advantage. For some others, maybe there is uh, some inconvenience to that. Um, let's come back maybe quickly to the notified bodies. So as we said, there is notified bodies that we had a bottleneck. And it's really a good news for all the companies that are looking for a notified body because as actually there are 12, I think, if I remember, uh, that are available for uh, on the on the Nando. Um, yeah. So it means that there is more time to have more notified bodies that are accredited. So it will help also the manufacturers um, because, I mean, for me, without those notified bodies, we were already in a wrong, in a, in a bad situation uh, for the manufacturers. So now this will be, give a bit of breath also to the notified bodies to be able to uh, provide the good service uh, with the MDR. So. Um, is there already some expectation to have a certain number of notified bodies by date of application now? Well, um, yes and no, it's, it's a good thing or not, because notified bodies that were already notified under the directives, um, if they get an additional notification under the NDR now, they, they won't double their capacity. So it's, again, it depends on the notified bodies load balancing. If they have more time to do all certificates, then, I mean, they, they can't, they don't suddenly have twice as much capacity if they can also do NDR certificates. So in the end, there is a total capacity of a notified body that doesn't become bigger. The only advantage is that by the date of application, there will, there will be more notified bodies to choose from. Okay. For new products, that's an advantage. But these notified bodies, um, yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in the additional date, I don't think it's going to make uh, a huge difference. There may be, may be some difference, but not, not a big difference because these notified bodies will be busy like crazy to clean up their backlog under the directives. And if they're doing that, then these resources cannot be, uh, cannot go to the NDR. Okay. And so also you have to take a, keep in mind that um, a notified body, when it is still in a designation process, is not allowed to do anything yet under the NDR. So it also takes a notified body once they are, uh, uh, it takes them at least six months to scale to full certification capacity. So Sorry. that means that, that any notified body that is, let's say, that is not uh, that is not designated in in 2020 is not going to make a difference for the MDR for the new date of application. Okay. So I think, yeah, there is really here a lot of challenges that uh, have to be overcome and uh, we have really to, to follow that. I mean, we'll continue one year more to follow that and to check what is happening, uh, what is published and what are the different, uh, different elements that are um, mentioned or communicated by the, by the EU Commission or Parliament. Um, so, um, Eric, any advice now 
for companies? Scenario, scenario, scenario? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think scenario is the right word because, uh, because what, we, what we see now, I see companies that are on the one hand angry with notified bodies that, that there are notified bodies now that are refusing to start up new MDD or AI MDD conformity assessment procedures because they're saying we don't have capacity. Well, I mean, you could have seen this coming from a long while uh, 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 away. So, yeah, I mean, this is something companies could have planned for. Another thing is that what I see with, with uh, clients is that um, the, the companies that really work like crazy to be finished by the date of application, they, are, they find themselves in the crazy situation that their projects are basically almost finished or they had to do a really big rush job at the end and they're not finished as they would have liked. But just like with the notified bodies, they have already, since this, these are multi-year projects, they've already allocated people to different projects by summer of 2022. Yeah. So there are companies that have, um, that have calculated like, okay, so for the MDR, I do need extra people because the PMS requirements are much stricter, blah, 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 all of that. So uh, uh, my whole MDR team, uh, I need one third to remain as additional staff and the other two thirds I will do, I will put on other projects like MDSAP and all that stuff. And now they are suddenly faced with a situation like these people, that these repurposed people might still be necessary depending on what the company wants. Because now you see management in those companies like yeah. jerk the wheel and say, ah, but all the, all the portfolio rationalization assumptions that we had, they are not true anymore. Regulatory department, do some magic for me and please also phase in all these additional products without extra people because those have been repurposed to MDSAP, uh, CFDA projects, all of that. So this is, this is all for companies. This is also, this is, uh, in, in some cases, it's terrible. And, and if you didn't have a scenario for that, yeah, then, then the joke's on you. Then you need to really prioritize. So there, is be, there will be really some uh, discussion, internal discussion now within the, the different companies uh, so that they have re to replan everything, to reschedule everything and to check all the projects one by one. So if you are listening, yeah, you have read to um, make some scenarios and check what, what, uh, what you should repurpose, what you should not, uh, consequently to this, uh, this, uh, this vote. Uh, but yeah, it's really, it's really, I think it's, it's, it can be a difficult, it can be a good situation for some companies, but really a difficult one for others. Well, and also with regard to economic operators, actually, there's one interesting one because, uh, because Switzerland and Turkey are, of course, uh, currently union with the capital U. Yeah. If you have completely switched around your economic operator structure, uh, betting on Switzerland not being union by 26 May 2020, that may have been a completely valid assumption. The joke's on you now because now it may be that it turns out that the Swiss wise enough uh, signed the, uh, the IF, IFA uh, at the end of this year and then suddenly uh, you moved around your whole supply chain for nothing. So that's, that is also something that, that uh, in terms of scenarios, yeah, that's, that's, that, that was a possibility. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think yeah, we, we have maybe during the weekend or, or next week, we'll have a lot of crisis meetings that are happening uh, just to define exactly what, what, should be, what should be done and how you can really um, yeah, have a good scenario for, for the next, uh, next step. Okay, Eric, so I think yeah, we really covered everything here. Uh, as I've said, we'll really continue to follow up and to check what is happening if there is some new communications and, and inform you uh, within this podcast. Um, but yeah, I think really here uh, we have a good overview of what, of what is happening as soon as um, we remind that as soon as uh, the, uh, the, this is published on the official journal. So it's not published now. As soon as it's published, then we can really say it's, it's okay, but we are betting that uh, it will be published. No problem for that. Okay, Eric. So um, something else to say for all the people? Um, yeah. Uh, stay safe and stay sane uh, during these uh, difficult corona times and uh, 
I would say if you have difficulties convincing your management about scenarios, why not read the ISO uh, 31,000 uh, standard? It's a really nice standard about corporate risk management that, uh, that actually says that you, you, you should be thinking about these things and even regulatory projects, you need to, uh, yeah, you need to not approach them in a completely linear, uh, linear fashion because if you do that, then uh, uh, changes like this can really, really take you by surprise and, and thoroughly mess with your uh, planning and resourcing. No, it's great. So uh, stay at home and read the standard for, <laughs> for uh, making some scenarios for your company. So great. Okay, Eric. So thank you very much and I wish you a nice day. Thank you too. Have a nice weekend, Monique. Bye. Bye-bye.